This is talk show host Charles Goyette from KFNX with another special feature from my Phoenix radio show for antiwar.com. All right, the Charles Goyette show from KFNX News Talk Radio 1100. Uh, I'd like to welcome back to our program great writer, uh, writes for Rolling Stone. His name is Matt Taibbi. You've heard him here on the show in uh, in the past. And he has a new book out called The Great Derangement, a terrifying true story of war, politics, and religion at the twilight of the American empire. Matt, good morning, sir. Good morning. How's it going? Well, it's going well. There you are in the, I guess, embedded journalism. You decide to embed yourself in the back room of Congress and... You, you watch legislation as it works. It's, nobody's supposed to do that. You know, it's supposed to be like sausage making. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, it's really funny. There was one day I was there, I think it was in 06, when they passed the omnibus appropriations bill, like eight of the 11 appropriations bills. So we're talking like a trillion and a half dollars. And I was the only reporter in Congress that day. <laughs> 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 uh, you know, that just tells you. I mean, I, you know, I cover the campaign now, and there's like a hundred reporters following John McCain everywhere he goes. Right. You when know, we actually spend the money, there's nobody there. It's pretty funny. It's really pathetic. You can get uh, you can get hours and hours of commentary on uh, you know whether John McCain should have used a green backdrop in his uh, in his uh, preemptive speech the other day, but you can't yeah. get you can't get a lot about the American economy falling apart. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Yeah. What, what was up with that green? I was there. And, uh, well, I, I do know what it is since he's our senior snowy-haired, peace-loving senator from Arizona. Um, uh, people in the uh, in the old kind of well, let's call them what they are. Call, people in some of the older communities, you know, the retirement communities and those sorts of places. They a, a lot of them really do like lime jello, <laughs> <laughs> and that's why that was that's why they chose that for John. No, that's just not nice. I know, but you're not very nice either. I mean, here you are, <laughs> here, here you are. Taking a good close look at Congress, and you figured out, you, Matt, you figured out that it's the Democrats and the Republicans equally guilty in this conspiracy to run government without anybody knowing what they're up to or interfering with their plans. That's really well said, bud. Well, I mean, uh, I, I think it's it's really funny. You know, a lot of the people in Congress are, are they're actually frustrated that there aren't more reporters around because you know even as they're this stuff, they're like, why isn't anybody stopping us? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, uh, it, you know, when I went there, uh, there's just this kind of amazement among a lot of people who work in Congress that the, the, the kind of stuff that goes on is so, it's so over the top and so crazy, and it, it doesn't get any attention at the hall. And sort of what I was trying to listen to. I mean, you know, they spend all day reading post offices and offering these sort of non binding congress. Or it's you know, it's partner or essential page or whatever it is. And then, you know, at night, they do all the important stuff, like rewrite the data act. And, hey, Matt, are you, on a, are you on a speakerphone? I'm on a cell phone. Huh? Cell phone. Am I losing you? No, well, I can, I can hear you, but it's really tough. Are you, oh. you're, you're not on a speakerphone, though, huh? No, it's a cell phone. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Hey, um... I, you start off. The first chapter of the book is is about one of our favorites, and I wonder if you could tell tell us the story of your uh, your investigation with the uh, of the Right Reverend End Times John Hagee. Well, you know, I, I wanted to do uh, the book has a lot to do with with sort of people on both sides of the political spectrum, you know, losing their faith in mainstream politics and retreating into conspiratorial weird sorts of political movements. So. I picked sort of one on both sides, you know, the 9-11 truth movement on the left, I, I guess, and then the, then on the right, I, I went for one of these apocalyptic churches, and then it was, it turned out to be Pastor John Hagee's church, and, you know, I didn't know that he was going to be a big deal this year in the election season, but um, I went down there and joined this, this church, and I had to learn how to speak in tongues, and, we, you know, we were taught to vomit demons into bags, and... It was a very, very weird situation. Uh, I mean, he's, he's completely crazy, and I uh, yeah, sorry, ended up sort of trying to describe all that whole indoctrination process in the book. Yeah, so that's the guy that's a uh, – that's the guy that, uh, that, that John McCain went like somebody said it was like a dog in heat looking for his endorsement, huh? Right, yeah, yeah which, which really surprised me when I found out about that because of all the – the crazy southern preachers out there that one could get an endorsement from. I mean, Hagee's 
you know, on a scale of one to ten, it's like that whole spinal tap joke. I mean, he goes to eleven. I mean, he's <laughs> he's really, really nuts. I mean, his uh, his his basic philosophy is that the end of the world is coming, and that we need to his his phrase is "hurry God up" uh, to get to the final battle at Armageddon, and therefore we need to support Israel because Israel's going to be on the good side at that final battle, and. So I guess he and he and McCain crossed paths at the APAC conference, or through their work at APAC, uh, the Israeli lobby, and so they've been fast buddies ever since. But I think McCain just didn't do his homework about that. Well, does does Hagee ever say anything about what a blessing it's going to be to the Jews to be gathered into one place so that they can go up in a uh, in a in a ball of end time smoke? I mean, that's basically <laughs> that's what he's recommending to them. Well, I mean, yeah, there was, there was one person, it wasn't from Hagee's church, but it was another one of these end-timers who said that if the Jews don't convert at Armageddon, it's going to be the mother of all holocausts. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the Israelis, are, are they, they understand what these Christian Zionists believe in, but they're perfectly willing to let them believe that as long as it, it, it results in, you know, temporal, earthly, political support for Israel. So... I mean, you even had Benjamin Netanyahu speaking at John Hagee's church, despite the fact that he believes that the Jews have to convert or or be burned, you know, at Armageddon. Well, it's a it's it's a, a little disappointing that uh, that John Hagee hasn't become the uh, the object of uh, of uh, talk show preoccupation the way that the Right Reverend Jeremiah Chickens are coming home to roost. Right has become. Right. Well, you know, I think. The, Honestly, you know, I hate to talk about racism in the press because, you know, I, I don't think there actually has been a whole lot of it. But I think in this issue, um, the people expect white Southern preachers to be nuts. I mean, I think that's just that's part of it. So it's not surprising when somebody like John Hagee gets up there and says, you know, the Catholic Church is like Hitler or Katrina was because God was punishing America for, you know, its indulgence of homosexuality. I mean, none of that stuff is surprising anymore. So I think that's one of the reasons that Hagee just doesn't have a whole lot of interest for American reporters, whereas Jeremiah Wright's kind of a new creature for uh, for the American media, and I think that's that's one of the reasons he's gotten so much press. Yeah, yeah. the derangement of the new. Matt Taibbi's on the line. The book is The Great Derangement, a terrifying true story of war, politics, and religion at the twilight of the American empire. Uh, take us to the uh, the war part. You spent uh, you spent time in Baghdad for the uh, the account, didn't you? Yeah, I was. Um, I, cu- I went to Baghdad for about two months in um, for covering it for Rolling Stone, and it's just a little bit little vignette in the book. But I had a lot of uh, odd adventures. I mean, I actually spent three days in Abu Ghraib uh, while I was while I was in Baghdad, and. Um, and I just sort of put, you know, the, the, the really odd thing about about uh, American experience in, 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 in Iraq right now is the way that we're so completely walled off from the rest of Iraq. I mean, you, you can go there and and not have any interaction with the actual nation of Iraq for months at a time. It's, it's really like being on Fort Benning or Fort Dix or something like that. And it's, it's to me, it's sort of like a metaphor for American society where we're so... We're so trapped in our own bubble, and we're we're so xenophobic and, and isolated, and really only see the rest of the world from television. And um, that's, that's sort of one of the things I was trying to get at in the book. Yeah, in fact, you, you you write the account. This was very moving to me. You write the account of some guys, and here they are talking to you, the anti-war reporter, and they're doing kind of a mock video. You know, hi, I'm the this guy, and hi, I'm I'm the good but decent white hillbilly guy, and the other right, guy, you right. know, I'm the token uh, black outspoken guy, and and uh, all the guys, and the next thing you know, you got bombs going off, and you reflect on it. Tell us that story. Yeah, we had to go visit a, a police station. Um, you know, that's really a lot, all of what these guys do is they go from the bases to Iraqi police stations, and they try to encourage them to go out and do their jobs. Um, so we we went from Camp Liberty to this police station, and again, these guys, while while we're in the base, while we're in Camp Liberty, they're all joking and laughing and putting on this whole up with people act for me because, you know, I'm, I'm the visiting reporter and everything. Uh, but when we get to the police station, uh, somebody blew up a car right outside the station and there was gunfire going off. And it just really, 
it drove home to me that these guys were so incredibly comfortable in their own environment, but they had no idea what was going on even 20 feet behind that wall. They didn't know who was blowing up that that uh, that car. They didn't know whether they should go out there to investigate or not. Um, and it was just, a, it, you know, it was a real striking portrait to me of a country that was at war with somebody and didn't know with whom, really. And and so I was, that to me was a very moving scene. Um, you you have a couple of chapters about uh, you know conspiracies, but the one that got my attention was the derangement of the peace movement. I paused me to stop and think for a moment and go, "What peace movement is that?" Because <laughs> right. I, I haven't seen much of one. But anyway, tell me what you're up to here. Well, I was just uh, I was trying to talk about um, you know when I was writing about Congress. I wanted to show that after the transfer of power from the Republicans to the Democrats in 2006, I wanted to show 